Where are all my friends? Tony Cowan Brown. Yay. Um, this is uh, this is one of those episodes that was meant to be it was. long time coming. Uh, but I love that it's in person. Yeah. Because we had a couple of chances where we could have done it over the internet. Uh, you do all sorts of your own content and podcasts over the internet. I but- live there. Yeah. <laughs> I live there. That's where I live. <laughs> On the internet. I'm seeing a physical manifestation of a person from the internet oh, in real there, life. There you go. But uh, I don't know. I think it's extra special. And especially so when you're special. here in LA and like, I don't know, there's just a certain energy to it. And I'm, I'm so glad that we get to do this Thank properly. Thank you for having me. This is fun. I was saying I recorded so many podcasts. They're all remote. Never done this. So this is yeah. a brand new setup. I love it. Yeah. It's funny for me because I had to pivot to like... Yeah over the internet during yeah. all things pandemic. And I kind of grew to like it because it's way faster and more convenient. Yeah. Like you saw how long it takes to set up yeah. the stupid lights and to do all the stuff. But uh, there is definitely a vibe in person. Oh, for it's sure. It's just like, I don't know. There's a vibe you don't get elsewhere, but also to your point, you get to see, I discovered this when I'm crying just because it's <laughs> bright in LA. When the pandemic hit, you realized, wait, I have so many cool people and connections can take five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Yeah. They don't need something that you set up over time. Yeah. And so you can meet people instantaneously and you can yes. make connections instantaneously, which is so incredible and powerful. But there's something special there. Well, what's interesting is you could, you always had access to that. But when when the pandemic happened, that, that had to be what it was. So yeah. it became yeah, more no normal to have that be your interactions yeah. and like where people were like oh it's different you need to come to LA blah 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 it's like well kind of but now not really yeah. and i love the shift now afterwards where you don't need it and you can network and you can do all of that on the internet but then when you do meet up in person you're like oh wait but this is also rad and special we are so much better off as humans if we can juggle both and i often say this to people who are hiring focus on the people who can make you feel something over the internet. Because imagine if they can do that remotely. Imagine what they do when they're in person in a meeting with you. Yo. Like truly, it's a special skill to feel heard over the internet. Like truly, like you're on Zoom and someone says, wait, hold on a minute. Mm -hmm. Say that again. That was so good. And in that moment, you can feel seen and heard and validated. And you're like, how is this person that's thousands of miles away from me? making me feel validated in a room I didn't even know existed. That is a skill set. And I only discovered this because I worked at a tech company that was based in LA. They were very much about the talent has to be here. And they were moving people across the country. They were asking people to, you know, up their families. And they're like, no, if you're going to work for us, you have to work here in LA. And then they had a realization of, wait, we're missing out. So because I think at a certain point, they got people pushing back on them saying, hold on a minute, I'm not moving my family. If you want me, you're going to allow me to work in Texas, or you're going to allow me to work in San Francisco or, or elsewhere in the world. And then I joined them and I was like, great, let's do this European expansion. I was like, we're going to start hiring people elsewhere. You're okay with that. I'm not sure as hell not moving to, to LA. And then they had a realization of, okay, we need to be more friendly and open to looking at the talent elsewhere. And then they had a massive pivot where we went from being remote friendly to remote first. Hmm. And the shift that that takes as a company to go, nope, all meetings, all meetings are happening remote. Even if there's three people in the office, you're all getting on a computer because you have to level that playing field. Mm. And it has to be democratic in that if you've got four people on a table and there's one person on a screen, that person feels left out. Yeah. So to your point, like how do you bring someone in? So I, the pandemic's been fascinating for a lot of people, but that I love seeing how people connect and collaborate. Yeah. And I love that we've seemed to have dropped that when we're all in LA, let's talk about this. No, no, because during the pandemic, I had a couple of clients that would say to me, when it's all over, you know, when this mm. blows off, let's sit. And now I was like, I don't think you realize we're still going to be here in a year. Like, yeah. do, do you have time to wait for a year? Because otherwise, let's let's get cracking. Let's get on a call. Let's get on a Zoom. Yeah. Time is not going to wait for us. This is not going to solve itself out. I really liked, uh, I noticed there was kind of two mindsets early on is like, you can be the victim and you can like yeah. wait for it to all be over and yes. get back to normal. Or you can have the like, all right, like let's figure out how we take the essence of that thing that we really wanted to do and adapt that to whatever we need to. And I, I think that everybody who did that grew so much because you stayed ahead while it was all fucking in the thick of it the yeah. most. But then you also now come out of it with the skill of like, you can do both, which is so tight. You have a brand new skill set yeah. and you're going to stand out. 
But wow, if that isn't a metaphor for everything that you and I talk about, of just like, how do you stay relevant? How do you stay on top of the game? And if you are constantly thinking, I don't like where the world is going, I don't like where it's going, I, 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 for, you know, I want the olden days, the olden days. Yeah. Forget, you're going to be left behind very quickly. And I'm not saying that you replace the new with the old and you chuck the old out. There's value in the old. But it, it, so it's not an or situation, it's an and situation. Like keep adding to your arsenal. I'm not saying that because you go remote first, all of a sudden in-person meetings don't matter. This matters. Yeah. But you're adding to your arsenal. Yeah, you're adding, um, yeah. So how do you stay relevant? Like how right. do you get the, now it's so cool to watch employees go, I can get talent from all over the world. Right. And which gets me excited because it means I'm working with the A team. I'm not working yeah. with the B plus team. I get yeah. to work with the A-team and that means there's someone in Shanghai, there's someone in Belgium, there's someone in downtown LA yeah. and we're doing something epic together, which also means you get diverse values and diverse opinions, which makes any project that much more exceptional. And it gives great people a chance to be great when you're not in a city that you maybe don't have access to or whatever. It's mm -hmm. fucking sick. But- I, so I want to get really deep. Went, I know, like, right? <laughs> I, I was thinking, but, and uh, we were worried we didn't know what we were going to talk oh about. Oh my no, god! <laughs> no, I, I like, and so what I do want to talk about is like your career and how you have stayed so relevant, and your general mindset and approach to all things creator and the internet and and whatever this economy is. But before we get into yeah. that, for a listener who doesn't know who you are. <laughs> To explain briefly who you are and what you do, because I want to put a little bit of context and backstory there yeah. to why I am so excited to have you on and why you can speak to that so well. And I'll, I'll share an anecdote which happened to me recently where this person was like, what do you do and who are you? And I'm <laughs> so confused. And I was like, I, I don't know if there's a succinct way. And it used to be easy. I used to... Here's what happened for me. It used to be easy in that I was like, oh, I work for Bursa Marcella. Oh, I'm a digital analyst and I do this. Or, oh, I'm a, I'm a technologist and I work for a tech company, tagline of the tech company and name. And then the pandemic hit. Both my husband and I, obviously, as you can tell, not American, working in America, had to change visas, had to update visas. We got stuck in Canada. I had to stop working. And I was basically had to force myself to go on a sabbatical. And I realized, oh, shit. Who am I? If you take away my job title and you take away the company for who I work and you take away the tagline of what I do on a day to day, what's left? <laughs> like, truly, what's left? <laughs> and so I would go back to, oh, well, you know, I studied politics and international relations for seven years. That doesn't tell you who I am. That tells you what I studied. Right. Or I'd go, oh, you know, these are my hobbies. Again, it doesn't really tell you who I am, it tells you how I spend my spare time. And so I had this moment of, oh, I've got a massive opportunity here to discover who I am if you take away the brand, the logo, the job title. Damn. And that was fun, freaky, scary, because there's something I came, so to your point, I like I studied politics and international for seven years. I ended up in politics in Belgium, realized I'd lived here for so long, I wanted to get out, worked as a digital um, campaigner and technologist and lobbyist, and then worked in technology. And then that's where, you know, draw a line in the sand pandemic hit. And then I realized the risks I don't have that thing that people would judge me on, which is like, oh, wow, you're an executive at a big tech company. Kudos, that's great. Yeah. Take that away. And I'm like, hey, I'm Tony. And they're like, well, what do you do? And I'm like, right now I don't do anything. And you just, you're, it's soul crushing. Yeah, it's so transactional. It's so, so just like, oh, she has this crazy title. Sick, I want to know her. I want to know that more. could benefit something. Or it's like, if that's not there, it's like, oh yeah, this person is just basically unemployed. I don't care. And you're like, what the fuck? Like, I'm a human being. I and, have all these skills. And, like, I, yeah. and to your point, like that question that you've asked me was the yeah. question I was asking myself. But how do you get to that really succinctly and quickly to yeah. keep someone interested so that they haven't walked off to the next person? Right, going, yeah. Like, like, what is that thing? Which is so... why I think I latched on to creator economy, content creators. Like, that's an easy thing for me to throw out there. Hmm. But then I had, talking with other people, they were like, no, you're, you're a media, you know, you grow, you grow media empires. I was like, oh, that sounds very obnoxious of me. And he was <laughs> like, well, you know, do, do it the American way where someone doesn't say I co-host the podcast. They say I built a media empire. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which, you know, as a European, it was like, well, you didn't. I was like, yes, I did. Um, it, the media empire is I coming. But American, it started, oh, yeah. I love like, juxtaposition position of just so bold and brash so bold. Like, does a podcast once yeah i'm basically a media mogul <laughs> on my it. own network not a big Wait. deal what's yeah. up like, which again love it like yeah. say what you want to do but any european would be like you know i just got mm -hmm. a little podcast that i'm doing on the side and this was the genesis of like what is it that i love doing and then i went back and realized every single job i had whether it was in technology whether it was in politics whether it was in lobbying or policy making was all about creating content that people 
could attach themselves to and run. So when I took the tech company based in America and did their European expansion, I wasn't doing sales for them. I wasn't doing marketing. I wasn't doing PR. I was creating really cool stories Mm. that people would be like, hey, we need to interview you on the BBC or we need to interview on Channel 4. Hey, wait, you need to be a panel panelist or a speaker. Or hey, wait, I want to close a deal with you because I want to work with you. And I realized, oh, wow, that has nothing to do with what I'm selling, the core product. Mm. It has to do with the storytelling. And I love sitting down in front of someone and going, how can we make this better? Well, you know, let's, let's, let's do some educational stuff together. And I realized that was the thing that kept, kept me excited. And so I started doing two podcasts and a newsletter, now doing some Twitch streaming somehow, and then started doing TikToks. So I realized that that is it. I love creating both educational and entertaining content that sits, and this is the most important thing, that sits at the intersection of all of these things, pop culture, internet culture, policy, politics, motorsports. Because I think the way the world has evolved is you can't, I'm a firm believer in this, not everyone will believe this, but or has to, but I don't believe you can sit down and talk about motorsports, for example, and not talk about policy and politics. I mm. don't think you can talk about the state of the world today in politics and not understand technology, not understand the role that Facebook and Twitter has in our political system. Right. They I can no longer live in an individual cannot, bucket. Yeah. We've moved so far past this to the, you know, even the fact that you and I sat here doing a podcast, you have to understand the tech component of this. Mm -hmm. You have to understand the production value of this. Mm. But not only that, when you go out in the world, you have to understand the marketing of this. Mm. So nothing, we're not, no one has one job or is working in one industry. Everything's intertwined. Mm. And I think that's the core of the most interesting conversations you can have. So as I said, when you ask me to introduce yourself, yeah. this is what I end up yeah, in. And parties people are like, Yo. yeah, can you get to the point well, where you tell me what you do? <laughs> you know what's crazy though is as you're explaining that and like, um, you know, we've hung out several times outside of podcasts and I understand that struggle to explain just exactly what Tony does because you're good at a lot of things, but you have your hand in a couple yeah. different things. And But as you were saying that right there in that moment, I was like, you're a storyteller. I story, yeah. Like, that's what it is. Like, it doesn't matter what company or if you're selling a thing or if you're working for a different company or whatever, you're so great at explaining the things that you're passionate about. You're so great at creating content because you're telling stories. And you understand a full story, understand a full narrative. Like, like, no? like I like that. I appreciate that. I'll take that. Like, is that not really? Like, in all of these things that you spoke to. Yeah. Like, and I, I don't mean to like say that or to, no, to diminish I, no, it. No, no, like, not at all. I think it's an epic. I think that that's so fascinating. And I think some of the best sales, the best marketing, the best teaching comes from being able to properly tell a story. And it's telling a story and then understand who you're talking to and talking yeah. with. So one of my pet peeves is all, and it's weird. And I don't know where it started, but one of my pet peeves is when people say, oh, I talked to her, I talked to him. It's like, you talked with him or just to them? Wow. And that's a teeny tiny thing that (laughs) I I have, you will never hear me say, I talk to someone. I talk with people. (laughs) And it's a, and people go, oh, come on, don't be that pedantic. And I get that. And also I'm like, no, but we, you connect with people. If I'm sat here just talking at you. You're going to gloss over in five I, minutes and go, this is boring. I'm I out. was just going to say, like, I, I've never said talk with or talk to, but I can. I always joke. I was like, oh, was that person talking at you? Yeah, there like, you it's th- like talking to and talking at, or I'll sometimes say, like, there's talking and speaking or yeah. communicating. Yeah. Communicating is an exchange of, an, of yeah. ideas and understanding. Talking to or talking at more yeah. so is just like, I'm going to tell you my opinion and I'm not going to wait for you to say what you think. And, and you, we're done. And you're like, you feel drained after. Completely drained. Yeah. And you know what's even more interesting? Tying back to like the whole piece that we were talking about, the evolution of remote work. It takes a very specific, unique skill set to actively listen to someone when you're on a screen together. And so I had a moment in my old tech company, we spoke a lot about active listening, the power of active listening. So most people today, you listen to be able to form your own response back to that person. Right. So you're not really listening. I'm not really listening to you. I'm already thinking about how I'm going to respond to that. And you haven't finished your sentence. Yeah. And we're so used to that. Like that's the, the media moves so fast. Social media moves so fast. We've got to have that instantaneous response yeah. and reaction to something. But when you active, you actively start listening and participating, something magical happens in that you're like, I've actually, that has landed. Mm. And actually the idea that I had in response, it's gone. It just, it, it left. It actually was never relevant. It was just me trying to, you know, have a rebuttal or have an answer to that. Wow. And I think there's something powerful there in the, the, the power of active listening, which allows you to talk with people versus at people. Yeah. Um, 
which I wish it's one of those things that's bizarre, but I wish that we taught that in school. Mm. You know, I, I have a, a take on that though. Tell me. I completely agree with you, but I don't necessarily fault people for not being able yeah. to do it. And I, I kind of really came to uh, huh. build on this theory in l- moving to Los Angeles where it's really fucking hard to live here. Like everything is expensive. Everything is traffic. Everything is a line. Like there's just like it's expert mode of regular life. And I would get really upset sometimes when I couldn't get the time of day or attention from people. And I kind of came to this theory of before like happiness, or as I always say, like there's survival and happiness. So the survival, like people are so focused on their own survival that they don't have time for happiness because survival has to come first. So people sometimes can't listen because all they're worried about is survival. Like they're so in their lane, not even maybe because they're self-absorbed, but because they're literally just trying to survive. That This now has become a habit where that's another manifestation of exactly that habit. Now, I'm not saying that that's a good thing or the right thing. No, but you bring up what a privilege to have this. What a privilege to be able to sit on the sofa, forget all of your ideas, your your Mm -hmm. preconceptions, all of that, and actually listen to another human being. But the fucked thing is that's where you grow the most. Like when you have time and you have the privilege to listen and to learn from people, that's where it's at. It's also how you create empathy, which is a thing that I find fascinating is that people I find, and I myself struggled with this, of what I meant, what people meant by empathy. And I realized, oh, shit. I had sympathy for people, not empathy. And there's a Brene Brown does this incredible explanation of the difference between sympathy. Sympathy is you fell down the black hole, you're down there, and I'm up there going, everything okay? Uh-huh. Is everything okay down there? Great. I'll sh- I'll throw you some snacks. And you know, when people come, empathy is let me bring a ladder, and crawl down in that dark space with you, and sit there and hold your hand, and we'll get out together. Crazy. And it's an it. Once you figured out, oh wow that's being empathetic. And how do you get then? You get by active listening and giving your time and all of that. But once you get that that moment of, oh crap, I now feel empathy for someone, mm. then you can do kick-ass projects together mm. because then that creativity comes up because you've sat down in the hole with yeah, that person. Yeah, you're all in that fucking hole together. You're, you're in just, that yeah. hole together. And you're like, okay, let's get ourselves out. What does that look like? Yeah. Such a privileged position to be at the top going, are you okay? Yeah, I'll yeah, throw yeah. you a few things from up here. But you can't get creative in that. Right, wow. Well, okay, so talking about that and talking about this explanation, just to say really like what it is of who you are and what yeah. you do, <laughs> the reason that I wanted to have you on the show is uh, I always want episodes to have utility. I always want yep. to inspire people. I, w- I always want to focus on different parts of creative jobs or careers that maybe somebody didn't realize exist or encourage yeah. somebody to keep going. And why I respect your story so much and who you are as a person is I think that you've had a lot of times in your life where you've had the chance to kind of take the big tech job or like the good salary and kind of just like chill yeah. and do the thing with the title yet that's really not who you are at all True. and yeah. you've you've uh really put a lot of work into defining yourself and doing your own thing and that's come with a lot of different things yeah um so I, i'm so curious to talk about and to hear how you kind of got to that point and what you're working on now and like what people yeah. can use out of that mindset. Uh, so, Here's an interesting yeah. anecdote that might be a fun place to start, which is the first ever serious job that I got, which mm. was working for one of the big global agencies. Now BCW at the time was Bursa Marstella. Mm. Um, and they merged with, I think, Conan Wolf. I was hired not for my CV, mm. not for my seven years of university studies, not for my grades, but because of my extracurricular activities. No shit. Only reason. And they what said were we're those? gonna. I'll yeah. get to it. Um, great question. Yeah. <laughs> um, they wanted. This was a traditional agency realizing our digital is a thing. You know, back in the day, this was like 10, 15 years ago. It was an after four. It was a side four. And they said, "Wait, you've started a blog. You've built a community. You've built advertising models for your blog. You're making money out of it. You're getting invited to all of these events." This was pre-influencer. This was like. 2008, 2009, potentially. Wow. They were just like, yeah, so we don't care about everything that you've done. Talk to us about this blog. I was like, you realize it's a, it was a lifestyle fashion blog, which really didn't suit me as a human being. But when I was going for college, I was getting invited to cool parties, got free food, got money on the side. I was like, this is great. And so they were just like, talk to us about this. I was like, you don't care about it. They're like, nope, we're not interested. You know how many people we see with exactly the same CV as you? Right. With exactly the same grades as you? We're not interested in that. What have you done on the side? And it told them two things. It was like, A, you've managed to teach yourself something that we're still trying to figure out. So we need that skill set. We need that value. Sick. Two, 
it tells me that all through your university, not only were you attending classes, you were building something of your own, which tells us oh my that God. you've got gravity. It tells us that you're onto something. Yeah. And I was brand like right out of college. Um, and that hit me. And my knee jerk reaction was, okay, now I've got a serious job. I should drop this. Yeah. Especially as a woman, because I thought, well, I'm going to go into all of these serious meetings. I don't want them Googling me and seeing my bloody fashion lifestyle blog. Oh my fucking God. I think as a dude, I would have gotten away with it. But as a woman, you're very harshly judged on, you know, well, look the part, but don't look like you spent 30 minutes putting on makeup and choosing your dress in the morning. Like show up. To, and I was told this point blank. Ew, like, show what up a shitty to, double yeah. standard. Yeah, yeah. Show up to the meeting, wear that dress. That, and I was like, you are not going to tell me how to dress. And I was sassy even at, in my early 20s. <laughs> Good. But it was always that. And even with my dad, it was interesting of just like, oh, you look great. I hope you didn't spend too much time, you know. And I was like, mm, how interesting. Yeah. Um. So I was just like, I felt, and I was kept thinking, I need to shut this down. I need to shut this down. And kept it going. And I'm glad I did. But that was my realization is from that moment, every single job I had, I got, not because of my CV, not because of the previous job, but because of the other projects on because the side. Because of your extra The last job I got hired is because of I had my podcast on the side and like, this is no cool. But shit. every single gig, well, even how I got into like the RS family, I was bored. Mm. I was stuck in Canada, couldn't work, on a full sabbatical. Yeah. I had friends getting into Formula One, texting me while messages all the time going, explain me the relationship between Red Bull. What's a D DRS? Explain me the engine switches. What's yeah. a V8 model? What's a V8? And I was like, okay. And I kept doing voice memos, notes, text responding. And then one of my friends like, give me a 10 bullet, like give me 10 bullets of what I need to know to watch my first official race when I get to it. And I ended up writing 54 pages. I love writing. Mm -hmm. And the dude was like, what the fuck is this? I'm not going to read 54 pages. I'm like, well, yes, you are. Yeah. Um, well, you asked. And then <laughs> you I asked. To write it, I deliver. This is what happens. This is what happens. But my me doing this on myself, this landed on the desk of relevant, interesting people that then put this on the desk of other people inside of Formula One that gets me a deal with Formula One that says, hey, can you write the official guide for Formula One? For 2021 that would have never happened if i would have sat and waited for that opportunity to come and for me to say yeah. you know who would write a great guide i would no write the guide yeah do the thing that you believe in someone's gonna take no and that's your next gig so the thing that i say to so many people who and i get messages every single day of like i'm a new content creator should I say these things because I want to work with X brand or that brand? And I'm like, well, first of all, you need to figure out, are you creating content to get a job? Or are you creating content for the love of it? I don't believe there's any wrong or right way for that. I, be mm. I really believe in people being smart and going, you know what, if I want a job in Formula One, I better start creating content. And I always tell people it's like your portfolio. Formula One really doesn't care about your CV. Similar to my story right back in the day, there's so many people with exactly the same. But if you said I spent the last year going to every race and I've taken pictures or I've taken movies or I've created these really cool graphics or whatever it is that you're good at, this is my portfolio. This speaks volumes. Hmm. Or you decide, wait, actually, I don't want this to get a job. I just love creating good content and I hope it attracts the right people or I hope it attracts the right brand. Mm. So I have that story with Formula One. But then what was interesting is I then turned that guide, real, like your relevancy piece. I realized TikTok is huge. I'm not succinct. I'm blunt, but I'm not succinct and I'm not to the point. So how can I teach myself that skill? I was like, great. There's this app called TikTok where you at the time could not record more than 60 seconds. I was yeah. like, how the hell do I explain concept terms in 60 seconds? Let's go. And that's after doing that for a year, it was interesting having someone like Aston Martin come knocking on the door and saying, hey, we love your values. We love who you are. And I remember in my first meeting with Aston Martin, pitching myself to them as you as you do, yeah. if you're a freelancer, if you're on a job, whatever it is. And they went, oh, we're going to stop you right there. And I was like, well, what do you mean? It's like, we don't need your pitch. We've watched all of your videos. We've been following you for a year. We've gone on your TikTok lives. We know who you are. We know what you stand for. We know your values. We're just here to know if you want to work with us. No fucking way. Wow, that was easy. <laughs> and I realized, oh, shit. It's not that it's easy. It's that I've done a year's worth of work out in the open. I've learned. I've failed. I've stumbled. I've succeeded. And now brands are like, yeah, we want that. Wow. So there's something beautiful about, and don't get me wrong, it's scary. And there's days where I turn to my husband, I go, I'm just going to go and get another exec job at a tech company. It's so much easier. So much easier. Because you leave a nine, yeah. what's the joke? You leave a nine to five job to do 24 <laughs> seven. Yeah. <laughs> the dream. Yeah. yeah, actually. But like, I, that's a cool part of your story that I think uh, I'm so glad you shared and that I didn't realize of like, for so long in your life, you've had the extracurricular activity. All the time. I can't think, I think you're similar, but I can't think of yeah, I any time 
where I didn't have something going. And you know what? That's a lie. When I did the US exp- the, U- the European expansion for this American company, I was all in. Mm. Um, and it was a remote company and there's an eight hour time difference. And I had a moment where, oh, I'm, I'm screwed here. When I would realize that I was on Slack or I was doing you know, asynchronous work with people, I did a full day of work in Europe. Mm. And generally when it's 5 p.m. in Europe, it's like 10 a.m. in LA. So everyone's starting to wake up and landing. And I would, and I was like, oh, great, you're finally here. I've got some questions for you. Let's do some things. Mm. And then I would be like, seeing people leave for the day going oh i'm done for the day i was like wait at this point i've done a full day's worth of work on the european time zone and now i've just gone and done another full days of work in the u.s time zone people in america are telling me they're closing out for the day i've just done two days of work in one that's insane and when you do that there is no more time for extracurricular extracurricular activities yeah and that's where i realized i was the least creative in my oh, career wow. and I was hitting a wall and I was trying to work even harder because the creativity wasn't coming. How did you fix it? And this is where I got into this. I realized there's a cycle of, I love that question actually, because it's, it's not an immediate fix, but you stand back and you go, wait, why am I hitting a wall? And you're hitting a wall because you haven't stopped to consume the content that's being put out there in the world. And so there's a, I call it like the, the consumption, the consumption creation I don't know if it's circle. I don't know. I, I wrote a post about it and I actually can't remember what I called it, but it's like, a, it's the, the consumption creation cycle that you have as a content creator, hmm. which is you overconsume, you get overwhelmed. There's so much out there. There's so many ideas that you have, but mm-hmm. you feel like everyone's already done it. Mm-hmm. Everyone's better than you. And so you pull back and you stop consuming and then your brain starts forgetting everything that you've consumed and your brain starts telling yourself there's gaps to fill, go mm-hmm. out there. You go out there, you've got a great creative momentum. You start cons- you start creating epic content and then you forget the consumption and your ideas dry out you're like oh shit i need to go and consume again you go back mm-hmm. and, and so there's this thing that we constantly do and if you wow. figure that out figure out what works for you and i think it's different for everyone mm. some put you know i know that for me it used to be i needed to consume in the morning and create in the afternoon that didn't work then i thought okay maybe it's one week on one week off and then i realized it's just a fluctuating thing that i mm. now know when my brain needs to consume mm. and when my brain needs to create Wow. And don't force yourself to do one or the other. But once Mm. you get into that model, then you realize this is great. I'm consuming, I'm creating stuff that I know people want to consume. Wow. And then you consume stuff and go, now I'm getting more creative ideas. See, you've got me fucked up there because I I like your more self-loving approach to that, where I remember- Well, okay, so I'll explain my side of it because I feel like I treat my, I'm way too harsh on myself about it. And hearing you explain it, I'm like, oh, fuck, there might be a single benefit here that I'm missing. And I'm like, wow, that's really special. Is uh, I'm not like world's biggest Gary Vee fan. And I think that he'll yeah. like really go too far on things, yeah. but I respect the hell out of him. But yeah. he he had this thing where he was like, create before you consume. Like he was like super simple, just little yeah. moment. And I was like, cool, I love that. Yeah. Because- to me, it's like I can, if I want to scroll, I have to earn it. So it's like, did I do the post? Did I did I post the podcast? Yeah. Did I make the thing? Yes. Okay, great. Now I'm allowed. And that's great. And I'm pretty good with discipline. Yeah. And that's awesome. But what you're saying there, the, the thing that I, I fear as I, I listen to you say that, that I might miss or that anybody could miss is your natural muse of inspiration if you just create on a schedule and you have a strong rule, what you're creating might not necessarily be relevant or uh, what you fresh don't have an emotional or, like, attachment yeah, to it. Because like you might just be doing it for the sake of a schedule yeah. where that works at the gym because like the human body is just like, oh yeah, cool reps and yeah. protein, like build muscle, whatever, or, like lose weight. But like for something like creativity, if you're just creating to create, and you're not taking yeah. the time to be inspired or put a message out, it's probably going to go nowhere. I couldn't have said that better. It's, it's, it works for tasks. It, that model works when you're just like, oh, there's 10 tasks I need to do. Let's do the worst ones in the morning. Let's get to the nicer ones in the afternoon. Right. Or, you know, on Mondays I do all my admin. Ta- like, yeah, Brian Tracy, but, eat that frog. Like, exactly. Exactly that. Yeah. But, and again, I say this as someone who tried to figure this out for so many years, but to your point, creativity strikes in. I have it sometimes where I would be like, I don't work after 10 p.m. And this was a new rule. And then I had a moment of, I, I, mm. I got a 
burst of energy and creativity right mm. now. Lean into it and go for it. Even though in my, and I work, like I have massive, I work everything in Notion. I have my Mondays through Sundays. I have all the tasks yeah, I need to do. Yeah. Got a memory like a P, like I don't it's, it's, remember anything. If it's not on Notion, it doesn't exist. Yeah, like, but like the organization that, is that's good. That's different. Yes. That's it. And yeah. so that I was treat exactly to your point, I was mm. treating my creativity, my content consumption, my content creation. I would literally have watch movie, watch documentary as a mm. task. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't, your brain does not work like that. Yeah. And so to your point, I know that you like go outside and take time for yourself. And those are the moments, which is why now I've tried to teach myself how to multitask that I will be on the peloton, I will be trying to do a workout and something happens. And normally what I would do is now it's not the time, focus. No, no, there's something that's happening right now that I need mm -hmm. to write down because I know if I don't put it down, mm -hmm. two minutes it's done, it's forgotten. Mm -hmm. And it could be a brilliant idea. Yeah. And that, but that is what is the hardest thing I think for creatives and content creators is you can't turn it off. You'll yeah. be in a shower and there's an idea. And literally right now, <laughs> at this point, I stop the shower, get out, dry myself, run to a piece of no paper, no, write it down, get back into the fucking shower. No fucking I'm also way. someone who needs to finish tasks. So I can't get out the shower and go, uh, no, no, I need to go back Way in and back. finish the task. That's Because <laughs> like for me, like I would have that idea and I would be in the shower and I would just say it over and over. I and I've tried that. And yeah. I, again, I, wow. my memory is so bad that I'll forget it and I'll be sat in the shower going, wow. what the fuck was that thing? And so this is my, the thing that I had the hardest to adapt to is, oh, this is, this is my life now. It's all the time. Yeah. Ideas strike all the time. Uh. Creativity strikes all the time. Or oh, it doesn't. And what you do, and the more you try and force it, obviously, the less it comes. And so there are days now where I allow myself to binge watch. I will watch 12 hours of YouTube and four movies. And I used to would be like hating on myself. Yes. Like, well, that was an epic waste of my time. Yeah, you it can wasn't. get some really negative self-talk and like you can get to a really weird spot. Yeah. Because it's not the nine to five that we were used to or told that that's what success looks like or that's what a good day looks like. Right. Holy shit. Yeah, that's that's really interesting because like, and I, I think the reason that I respect it and I love talking to you about it so much is like, for lack of a better word or phrase it's like you're not some punk kid that got lucky with it like you're mm. a fucking mature grown fucking human yeah so for Somehow, you yeah. to process <laughs> this and to to grapple with it and figure it out it's like oh yeah like we all really do go through this and this whole oh. landscape is changing and there's not necessarily like a right and a wrong answer Truly not. But hearing you kind of explain that that process kind of like re-inspires me to think of creativity less as a task and more as like Legit. like a, a calling when yeah. like you don't know when the package is going to get delivered, yeah. but like go answer the door kind of thing. And you'll hear like there are, you know, I'm not a musician, but you'll hear musicians say like, you know, if you want to make this work, be prepared to like be sat. You know, go and take a break at a wedding and go and sit in the bathroom because there's an idea that strikes and you yeah. sit on the toilet for two hours and people are wondering where the hell you are, but you yeah. you had to get it out and yeah. you had to get like that yeah. idea pen to paper. Yeah. Um, I get that now, mm -hmm. um, which I never used to have. Mm -hmm. And then that's where it gets overwhelming in today's world where there's, you know, long form content creation, short form, you need it now, you need to react. There's, mm -hmm. there's the, you know, I'm was talking to you about, I figured out, you know, I do long form writing, love that short form video with TikToks, which completely blew up. I understood that space. I was excited to learn about that space. Mm. And now I'm thinking about longer form audio video content. Do I go to Twitch? Do I go to YouTube? Yeah. But it's a, you have to also embrace the, but I think so the question I get from so many people, which I find fascinating, and it's generally young women because of the content that I put out there in the world, but they want to know what they need to do to get success. Hmm. But they can't define what success looks like and they don't know what success looks like to them. So when I ask, okay, well, that's great. You want to be successful. Why? Right. Or what does that look like? Hmm. And they go, what do you mean? Well, is success that you have 50,000, 100,000, a million followers on, on TikTok or elsewhere? Or is success working with a, a specific brand? Hmm. They can't answer that. So what's the, So again, you go back to, well, why are you having these questions? Why are you stressing yourself out? Yeah. Well, I don't want to just put stuff out there that doesn't do well. well how do you know if you haven't tried? Right. And so there's some, there's a, I don't know, I don't know what shifted and when, but because the whole world, especially after pandemic, after the pandemic, everyone was like, oh my God, content creator economy is booming. Anyone can, we've all lowered the barrier to entry. We all can have access to the tools and the software to be a podcaster or to do YouTube videos or to create content on TikTok. Like it's never been easier and you can make a whole bunch of money for you, for yourself. 
And then that means that content creation has been less of an art and it's been like a tool mm -hmm. to achieve something. And yes, brands are paying a fortune for people to create organic content about their products. And so you sort of go, wait, hold on a minute. What is it I want to do? And so it's always fascinating when people go, well, how do I get successful? Why do you want success? What does success look like? Why are you creating this content? So I think we just need to start asking ourselves these questions. And I hadn't I wasn't asking myself these questions. I just knew I loved creating content. Mm. But there's a point where you're just like, now I need to make money off of this. Because mm. to your point, I was looking at this going, I probably at some point should go back and be an executive for a tech job. Right, because you knew what that was like. I knew what some that was like. Some kids that's don't easy. even know that. No. Like, that's got to be harder for you. And you're like, fuck, it's easier right. on the other side if I want it. Yeah. And uh. it truly is. And I love, and this is the other thing. I loved it. Mm. It's, I'm not someone, and when I talk to people, people are like, yeah, it was it, like, I can get, I get what you want out of the nine to five and the grind. No, no, I loved it. I loved building a tech company, doing the expansion, building teams, bringing revenue, closing deals, closing our first million dollar deal, our second million dollar deal, our 50 million. Like, I love that. But there was something missing for me, which was, I'm an interesting person and I've given my whole life to this and I'm not doing my extracurricular activities, which is the thing that people found interesting in me when I was at dinner tables. Oh. And it was the thing that got me the next job. So there's something missing that I'm not allowing myself to do all these other things. But also then I get into, could I ever be the person that has just a nine to five job in tech? Yeah. Because I pour my, and you're similar, we pour mm -hmm. ourselves into something. Mm -hmm. And so now I'm trying to step back, figuring out, well, is there some way in between? Do I freelance and have a part-time job doing something for someone else that, again, I love doing, but it's not for me, and it puts mm -hmm. the money on the table, and then I go and fuck around and have fun with all of these other things, knowing that one of them, one of them will explode, and one of them will, will be lucrative, and one of them could be my future career. See, I, I think uh, in the bit that I know you, and I have, I have a two thought here, I have my, my that, and then I, I, I'll get there, I'll get there. Yeah, this yeah. is me thinking You're like, out loud. We're, we're similar, we go yeah. on a journey. Well, because I, I know I have a question for you of content, but uh, to, to that, I, I think, I don't think you're meant to work for other people mm. in the like, I just think that there's a certain amount of clearly you've figured out how to do your extracurricular. And especially with the pandemic, you were forced to yeah. almost only do that. Yeah. And we even talked about this a little bit. It's like it's so easy to champion somebody else's thing, Sweet. but it's very scary to confront the like, okay, what if I like applied it all to yeah. myself and doubled down? But I think, I think I see you doing that more and more yeah. right now. And it's so exciting for me and it's so encouraging and inspiring. So I think think you just have it and you know it it's scary to just go for it yes so you've got no one else to blame mm -hmm. but no one else to hide behind yeah and i think to your point it is so much easier to say it's weird as humans we have this thing and like people who say they don't have this are lying but they're like why not me uh -huh. Someone else went successful. Why can't I do that? Uh -huh. And then you look at yourself, go, I've got that in him. And then you switch. You go, I yeah. can do that. I yeah. can absolutely do that. And then you go, but really, can you do that? Mm -hmm. And also, do you want to? Because yeah. that's the thing. So someone asked me the other day of like, hey, actually not the other day, like, can I work for you? Like, can I intern for you? Like, what do you need? And I realized that I love collaborating with people. I do not like managing people. Mm. It's not a thing that I enjoy doing. And the moment you start building a team, you need to start managing people. Mm. And you talk, especially in a tech space, you talk to these incredible tech people who have a vision for a software company or who've built the software and then who have to become CEOs of their company and they realize all they're doing is admin, operationals, hiring, firing, and they're like, right. my creativity. And actually, I think that's the genesis story of the guy who created Patreon. He was a musician, mm -hmm. loves creating music, and then realized there's another way for people to be patrons of these musicians. Let's forget the traditional model. Let's create. And so he had this idea, yeah. created Patreon, and then realized, wait, all of a sudden now I'm the CEO of a tech company building tech, and it's not what I want to be doing. I mm. want to go back to, so he's got, and I think we all have that in us of just yeah. like, what happens if I love, which is again, why I think the content creator economy booming is interesting because you can, this is my thing. I would want to be a multi-million dollar company of one. Mm -hmm. That's my yeah. dream. Wow. Yeah. I don't want anyone working for me. Yeah. Don't, I'd love collaborating with people. Yeah. But what would it look like? And I don't even know if there's a, there must, there's a few, you know, big influencers, YouTubers, but they've all got giant teams now behind them. But what does it look like? Can you be a company of one? A, Whoa. A million dollar company of one. Right, because like we know the behind the scenes of like what it actually takes. Like when some of we these influencers yeah. like really start getting like, proper yeah. deals and dollars and all these things like yeah there's a big team around it like is it possible is it possible and right now when you look at it i'm 
doing podcasts and writing a newsletter to the, to be the the American I built my media empire there. Yeah. I'm doing all of these collaborations. I'm now streaming on Twitch. I'm building a brand. I've created mm. the merge. All of this I've done by myself. I'm not working with editors. I'm not working with producers. I'm I'm outsourcing some of the stuff, but they don't work for me. So right. what does it so I've got these incredible collaborators who help me bring the vision to life. Yeah. But is it possible to make million plus by your own? That's a fun journey that I'm finna finna follow along and yeah. see. But that's cool because that that's kind of you defining success, that's is it, it not? Because get, success like, to success. me isn't isn't automatically. I know that I don't think I would be happy being the CEO mm. of a giant company mm. managing a lot of people. I've done it for other people, and I find it extremely stressful. I find human beings very complicated, mm. which I love. Mm. But I also know that you, again, like this active listening, this empathy, which is it becomes interesting. I think in today's world of what does it, I don't think people have. What I'm trying to say is I think we're very privileged to be able to have conversations like this and think I can choose the job that I want. Mm. And if you're going to do it, embrace it wholeheartedly. Yeah. Um, and don't be, you know, don't be selfish. And, and what you said there just hit me of just like, I don't, I want to stop doing this for someone else and helping someone else's dream. And I don't think it's selfish to say that. I, I generally think some people are meant to build their own thing. I think more people should say it because yeah. it's almost like uh, uh, like you feel like it's this cocky, brash thing to yeah. say where it's like, I have met some people that don't fucking want to do that. Like they yeah, genuinely yeah. want to stay under the radar. But I've also met people that almost feel like they're they're too timid or they're not allowed to just say like, I want to fucking be famous. I want to do yeah. this. I want to own this. Where it's like, own that truth faster and like, go try it. Like, it's okay. You're doing no favors to people by lying yeah. to yourself and fitting in like, you know, the square peg circle type you know analogy. What, uh, you know what's interesting? Listening to you say that mm. reminded me of a thing that happened this weekend when I was watching the Silverstone um, Formula One GP and they zoomed into, I think it was like Lewis Hamilton, seven time world champion. And I think Tom Cruise, most people know who Tom Cruise is. And uh -huh. I was looking at those two talking to each other. I think I turned around to my husband and I said, Imagine what it must be like to be at the top of an industry. Mm. I want to know that feeling somewhere. I don't care what industry, yeah. because truly I love so many industries. Yeah. But that's also my problem is from a young age, I just spoke with someone today who like, she knew she wanted to be a filmmaker. Mm. Since God, I'm so since, jealous of those people. So jealous. And again, it's funny because I think for so long, I thought I was missing something, thinking I don't have my one thing. Ugh. I could be, I've gone from, I want to be a lawyer to an astronaut to a scuba diver instructor. Uh, I've done it all. But uh, it's because I love so many things, which is why me talking about the intersection of so many things is unique to me, but it's also the thing that I can truly authentically talk about. Yeah, yeah. But I really, I sat down and turned to my husband and thought, well, how incredible must it be to be at the the, the 1% of an industry and mm -hmm. know that you are that fucking good. yeah. And I was like, I want to, and my husband was like, I don't, I, and he's like, he's, he's always likes to be the CEO of the CEO. He's like behind the scenes. He likes to, you know, the puppeteer yeah. and that's great. And he was like, no, I just, I couldn't care about that. He's like, God, I hope I achieve that someday. See? But, but that's it was the sick. first time that I voiced out of like, that's what I want to do. Like to your point, being a storyteller. Yes. But I want to be the top 1% of some in one industry. Now what's cool is today there are so many more jobs than there used to be that these pools of expertise and skill set are becoming smaller and smaller that I think it is easier that there aren't like five industries in which you yeah, can go Yeah, totally. See. There's so many, you know, there's being a, the best Twitch streamer out there, the best YouTuber, the best yeah. TikToker. There's so many things that I think makes it more feasible to think about. Yeah. But, but I don't, do you have that, do you have yeah. that thing that you're just like, I don't know exactly what I want to do, but I, there's something there that I know I want to achieve. Oh my God, 100%. Like I, I, the curse of like, I see the person that knew that they wanted to play guitar forever and I'm like, God must be nice. And I joke like, cause you know, like jack of all trades, master yeah. of none. And that saying would always yeah. torture me cause I felt like that was yeah. me. And now more so I say jack of all trades, master of some, which <laughs> helps like a little bit, yeah. but I completely feel you on that. And I actually do like, I, I always joke, like I think about like the Bill Murrays and like the rad yeah. celebrities and I'm like, God, I want to become famous purely so I can be so fucking nice to everybody, like just to set that example. And it's not like I'm like out here trying to be like top celebrity, but like I'd absolutely be lying if like you don't do a podcast for three years if and you not. don't want some amount of attention on yourself, yeah, right? Yeah. So like, yeah, well, if you believe you have a value to add that absolutely. isn't there right absolutely. now that people need to. 
Yeah. And it's funny, like, as you were saying it, like defining your success, I think more and more recently, I've really stopped and thought about that because it's not so much like the money of it. Like I was like, I kind of asked myself that question of like, why? Like, why do I care about this podcast? Why do I want it to grow? Why do I, why? And I think for me, the thing that gets me excited is I really want, I I think my favorite thing is, is learning people and talking to people and sharing stories and all that. And if that can help inspire other people, like to help exceptional people achieve things they wouldn't otherwise be able to do through like the podcast is great. But further on that, I just love the idea too of like, if I were to build something with enough brand loyalty and trust that then I could showcase talent and help other people grow through that and like build yeah. community with that. Like fucking A, like we yeah. won. So that to me is like my why. That's your why. Um, but yeah, like I completely feel you on that. The question, I didn't forget my yeah. question that I have. Oh, you see, I see. I'm terrible at being succinct. <laughs> but I think What's, we needed to talk about yeah. that. But, so as you are going through all of this, and I think like we talk a lot about like, how to create something that you care about and how to stay authentic and all these things and what it takes. And I'm curious right now, like in this very moment, like we were talking a little bit about Twitch and I want to hear a little more of that, but like, what are you, what are you excited about right now? Like as a creator or storyteller, like doing these things, like right now we're recording this in July, 2022. Like what do you, what do you think is exciting? Like you've mentioned long form content a little bit. Like, are you, is there anything you're focused on? Is there anything where you're like, actually like, oh, there's a spark here. That's fun. There's two things I think that are top of mind. There's one thing that I've noticed that I'm getting excited by of what does it mean to create something and then have it be, create something and then diversify the streams of income. So I, for example, I came up with this concept um, of, I created a video called The Ode to the Sunday Fan Girl, which was this whole idea of seeing all of these young female fans coming into Formula One, but in sports in general, and being ridiculed and shunned and being told to shut up and being told that they're ditzy and crazy and bad for the sport, when the reality is the young female fandom, I mean, you look at what the young female fandom did for the Beatles, did Mm. for Harry Styles, and, you know, the Beatles were told, by the way, you're going to need to find another demographic where you're never going to be taken seriously. Can you imagine? Wow. Because young female fans are just not not it. They're not cool. They're not hip. You you're know, not going to be taken seriously. That's a reoccurring theme on this podcast is how angry I get at people being too good for fans. And uh, one of the most wow. popular like TikTok clips yeah. of the podcast is um, basically somebody sharing that fans know better than the industry and the power of using fans and how the industry will say a bunch of big words and pretend like they're better than fans and fans are over here like oh we know it better than you so everything you're saying there i'm like yeah yeah and harry style it was fascinating watching harry styles defend the young female fans going you're absolutely insane you don't get it these women know what they're talking about and this is this is the reoccurring theme with young female fandom is they self-organize they don't call they call bullshit they have the finger on the pulse. They know what's next. They do their research. They come prepared. They build community. They build worth of mouth. And they're spending their hard-earned cash. Yeah. And yet they are still not taken seriously. They How are the still fuck? ridiculed. And it's insane. Yeah. And this is true in music. Yeah. But it's very prevalent in sports as well. And we See, were seeing this in F1. That's crazy. Because the a huge amount of guests and listeners that I have on this podcast come from music. That was my yeah. origin story. That was my... Yeah. So I talk about this up and down with me music yeah. and it's everything you're saying but for you to be like yeah yeah yeah, that's the thing in music but it's real in f1 and it sports i'm like oh no shit yeah like, yeah it is real and there are <laughs> google came out with their recent like trends report for 2022 and they said something that i was just like you like jumped out of the page for me which is fandoms are the most powerful form of community of course it is it's grassroots it comes from the bottom no one's forcing it they want to do it they self-organize you name it so i did this video the ode to the sunday fan girls and what i realized is i wasn't experiencing this because the content that i was putting out on tiktok was very factual so it's very hard to hate my content love my content mm. it's factual it's like yeah, yeah, yeah. historical facts it's cool interesting things it's what's a drs what's whatever it is yeah i was not being very opinionated and by the way Part of that was purposeful because I did not know this platform. I was like, I'm not going to put too much of myself out there. Mm. It is actually scary being an opinionated, even though I'm a very opinionated person. But I also realized at the time in the sport, I wasn't deeply opinionated about certain things because I was focused on the sports only. 
yeah. realizing that the thing that I'm good at is sports, pop culture, internet culture. And so when I started looking into the fandoms and I started looking at the evolution of broadcasting, like that's when I, I think started to shine and my content started to be interesting. But so did this video, O to the Sunday Fangirls, it kind of blew up. I got a lot of young women going, thank you. Like it was about time someone spoke up. And and then I got the screenshots and the messages of the absolute vitriol and the hate that they were. I mean, it was bad. And it was the usual thing of shut up. You don't know what you're talking about. Women are destroying the sport. Here we go again. You're only in it for the men. And you just kind of look at this going, you realize they're driving around at 300 kilometers an hour, wearing a full suit, wearing a helmet. Sure, I'm in it for the cute guys. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then realize this is this is you know you could, come on find a better that's you know, really find a better, funny find a better excuse it um, got funnier as you said it i thought about <laughs> it and i was like wow that's funny oh that's really funny I mean, it's like come on and that got me to create the sunday fangirls which was this whole platform for having these conversations this whole platform about why is it as a sport the women are ignored as a sport the female and you see it with drivers very few of the drivers lean into their female fans openly they, really? they skirt around it they appreciate it, but none of them are saying, you go. Like, these young women are fucking here because they are creating content every day in their bedroom. Some of them as young as 14, 15. They're creating word of mouth. They're creating content out there. Yeah. They're bringing in their friends, but no one's really embracing them. And the reason for that, I realized, was my own issue was the issue with the word fangirl. And I, was, and I would never want to be associated with a fangirl. Mm. And then I went down that rabbit hole of the genesis of the word and realized it was never a negative term. It was taken by men to ridicule women yet again. And then I started to, so anyway, created the Sunday fan. And I'm answering this question because then created the Sunday fangirl platform which then meant i started creating merch around it and realized mm -hmm. the merch was actually a conversation starter so where i realized this was when young women were telling me hey i got my cap signed by lewis hamilton and i put in front of him the cap that says sunday fangirls and that prompts the driver to say huh, what's this talk to me about what is a fangirl what is what is this start having a dialogue another woman was sent me a message the other day saying i was in the paddock which is behind the scenes where all the drivers are at a formula one race and saying i felt completely out of place completely overwhelmed didn't think i belong which is a recurring theme for a lot of people but especially i think young women and she said and then i spotted a sunday fangirl cap and i beelined across the paddock grabbed that person said you and i need to be friends and those two are now friends and going to other races together and then realized oh wow it's so much more than merch mm. and so this got this is what i'm excited about is how an idea in today's day and age this an idea a concept a video can spark a movement which can then create merchandise create more videos potentially create a movie create Ooh. a documentary so that i like instead and of community thinking, and community yeah. And it, there's no stopping. Create an NFT brand, create a Discord channel, create a Twitch. And this gets me excited. It's like the spider web kind of scenario of all of that can drive revenue, but all of that means you've got all of these different entry points into mm. an idea. That I find fascinating because I think the barrier to entry for that is so is has never been lower for mm. a single human yeah. to say, I created a platform, created yeah. merchandise, created a Discord channel, created a community here. We're doing going live, bringing people in. That's cool. So yeah. I'm excited by that as like a concept of, and I never had, I think, my anchor or my North Star. And I think now my North Star is like that Sunday fangirls piece of just like, okay, what? let's go in. Fuck, that's cool. Um, and that also does kind of encompass a lot of the things that you're great at. And it just gives it like yeah. an anchor to, to create around. And it's interesting, like sharing that with you is the reminder that I needed that I didn't just create a TikTok video about the Sunday fangirls. Mm. I didn't just create a couple of t-shirts and a couple of hats. No, right. no, there's something bigger to it, which it to your point, something. it's like, I don't have a podcast. I have a media company. Yeah. I created a platform to have hard conversations, yeah. which I'm excited by. The other thing that is exciting to me in terms of what you're, you know, what you're saying, like, what are you noticing right now? I think this is what attracted me. And I don't know if you've had this experience, but this is what attracted me to TikTok, and I had been off of Instagram for so many years because I hated the curated aesthetic of Instagram. It didn't ring true to me. It was false. It felt like a lot of work, for very little return. Yeah. Didn't feel authentic. Didn't yeah. feel me. Yeah. I think, again, especially as a woman, I feel like the standard is so fucking high to be all the time perfect. Like, I'm done. This is not me. And then I found TikTok and I was like, I am loving this. Oh this my God, yeah. fucking chaos. It was, yeah. it was chaos. Yeah. It was truly like that meme where it's like, everything's okay and the whole house is on fire. Yeah, That's that the feeling TikTok, I got yeah. with TikTok of like, what is happening? There are people outing husbands who are cheating on their wives. There are people with their kitchen on fire. There's a rat running loose. Like, I was like, what is happening? Yeah, it was this. the furthest thing from curated. Furthest yeah, thing. Yeah. 
And people weren't going viral because of a beautiful, beautiful aesthetic or they weren't being successful. They were being successful because it was funny yeah. or they had a creative take on something. And I think I'm seeing that play out in long form content again mm. with instead of doing a beautifully edited, thought out show, mm. press live on Twitch. Wow. And I think that goes back to the genesis of Twitch as just in yeah. TV of like, what does it look like when you just get raw emotions? Ooh. And that excites me of like the unedited, the unscripted, the realness of people, which hits to the authenticity, which hits to the empathy. You, I can be empathetic of someone. I went live once on TikTok. I was like, I'm going to have to have a small break because the whole thing started burning up. My Basically, my uh, ring light just started catching fire. I was like, I just have a fire to put out. But it didn't, no one, no one could care less. Yeah. Like, I hope you're okay and the house doesn't burn down. Right. But it was part of the programming. And I'm excited by that because I think that's what's going to allow us to build better community, have better connections, real authentic connections. Again, like this, we didn't sit and prep for 40 minutes exactly no. what you were going to ask me, what my answers were. Right. And there's something beautiful, and I think it's a skill set of being able to set someone up for success and yeah. think about, hey, this is the things that I have in mind, and this is going to be how we're going to... But it doesn't mean that it's scripted. It doesn't mean that it's no. been edited. It doesn't mean it's just a... Com so that I'm really excited about. And I think... Twitch is one of those platforms that could allow for that. Yeah, yeah. I think that's actually a great way to conclude because uh, that's something that you're, when this is coming out, like it'll be like in the thick of you mm. doing it. Um, it's something that I haven't dabbled with. Uh, I'm close with a lot of people that do a lot of things in Twitch. I love the platform. Yeah. I'm a big Twitch champion. Yeah, as a consumer. Uh, not even like, I don't, just, I don't watch Twitch streams. I just fuck oh. with it. I just fuck with like community. Like I, oh, love, I love what that. it represents. So you don't create the content on there. You don't consume the content on that, but you like the idea of what it stands for. I'm just like a, like a, like a dude standing on the yeah. sideline. That's like, Oh, that team won. That's cool. Fuck yeah. Like yeah, yeah. I, I just like what it is because I think for both sides, like it gives people community, which I love. Yeah. And it also gives creators a place where they can be more real and where they can yeah. kind of just like dig into things deeper. So I don't say it like I, I could be fucking up not to be taking yeah. a part in it more. So that's why I'm curious of like what you're doing. And I think your approach to what you're about to do and kind of what you're playing with is really cool. So I th would you would you explain that a little more? Would you share that yeah, with me? No, happy to. And look, it's one of those things that we I think we talked about briefly here is don't wait Mm -hmm. for the perf and it's so look i don't like dishing out advice because it's so easy to dish out advice yeah. and not take your like, like i'll call so bs on that easy, yeah. the th if there's anything that i've learned is don't i would rather be better than right huh. i would rather be better than perfect if i am and i and this is the thing i am not ultra competitive with other people could mm. not care less you won great i lost who cares yeah am i better than i was yesterday that's what excites me Ooh. am i worse than what i was yesterday let's talk about that yeah and so that I always talk about, I'm a work in progress and this is why I love the, I think this is why I love all the educational side of things. And it just so happened that I did it in tech and I'm doing it, did it in politics, did it in tech and now doing it in Formula One. But when I was growing up, I struggled with where I could learn in public. I'd go to school and you'd be humiliated by your teacher or your peers if you didn't know the answer or you did bad on your math oh, test. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I struggled with that. I was a bad student. I'm a smart person, mm. but it took me a long time to realize that I was a smart person because I, for the life of me, didn't do well with standardized tests for the li because I was petrified. Yeah. Petrified of being wrong. And I just struggled, straight up struggled. And so kept thinking, I'm dumb, I'm dumb. This is not working, this is not working. And then went off and did seven years at uni and fucking crushed it mm -hmm. um, and, <laughs> and loved every moment. But, but finding a, like a safe place but to But finding us, and even at uni, I tried, I did uni in Belgium and the Belgium system didn't work for me, did it in France, didn't really work for me. And finally in the UK system, I was like, okay, I can mess up here. I can, I, and the rigidness, what the irony here is the rigidness of the Belgium and the French system actually gave me a leg up in the <laughs> Anglo-Saxon system where they were like, we love it because you're not just vomiting your ideas. You're coming with a structured approach and the purely structured approach didn't work for me. And so I was coming at it at both. And I was like, this is great. I finally found my space, but it's the set. And it goes back to the Sunday fangirls, these young women who are just like, I have questions, but I don't dare to speak up because I'm going to get ridiculed because oh. I'm told yeah. if you don't even know what a DRS is, what the fuck are you even doing here? How bad You don't know who Michael Schumacher is? Get out. Right. She's 14. Of course she doesn't yeah. know who Michael Schumacher is. Yeah, like, yeah. What are you talking about? Mm -hmm. And so I think that deep desire of, I want to learn in public. So the, I'm going back to your answer of, I realized I had a moment, I can't remember when it was, of, 
holy shit, no one actually cares if you fail but yourself. And mm-hmm. if you can get over mm-hmm. that and learn in public and learn, there's more good that's going to come out of that than bad. And so for every project I've done, there's another project that's happened. And so based on the work that I've been doing in the last 18 months on TikTok and growing that community from zero, as everyone starts, to I think I'm at 72,000 or something like that on TikTok, oh, no. bought me opportunities like Twitch and Twitch approached me and said, hey, would you be interested? We'll pay you a flat fee every month for you to live stream a certain amount of hours and like, get cracking it. The only thing that you need to do is hit a certain hours and you ha- it has to be just chatting about motorsports. And I was like, you know what? I've been thinking about my long form content, YouTube or Twitch. And I was like, oh, I'm essentially being paid mm. to kickstart a new program for them as they're trying to get into motorsports because it's very lucrative, the entertainment motorsports, but also sporting industry for all of these streamers right now. Mm. You can see it. There's document, sports documentaries being done left, right, and center with Netflix, Apple, Hulu, you yeah, name it. Yeah. It's a lucrative business. And it's lucrative, by the way, because I think the very stale approach that we've been used to with broadcasting rights over the years isn't gelling with today's world of no, TikTok, short form content. We need it right now, unedited, unscripted. Like there's something unique yeah. happening. Yeah, like the sports themselves are still fucking sick, but yeah. the way that it's being broadcast is becoming so antiquated. That's it. And and talk about relevancy and not keeping up with things. And I think to your point, this is also why I love trying new stuff and being forced outside of my comfort zone to try new things. And look on Twitch, I started was it two weeks ago and i was at zero and it's very yeah. weird yeah oh yeah it's humbling as hell it huh? is humbling as hell yeah. going live yeah. and speaking to absolutely fucking lutely no one but yourself oh my god it is humbling it teaches you a lot about yourself yeah it takes patience but here's the thing is because i built an audience on tiktok tap into that audience create that audience as a funnel start bringing them over and it was, it, it was weird because I felt bad of trying to force people off of a platform. But I think we're all agnostic to the platforms these days. We all see, you know, a value in Twitter for something, Instagram for another thing, TikTok. Or some people are just like, no, I'm a diehard Twitch streamer and nothing else matters. Yeah. But you start learning these things only by doing. And mm-hmm. so I like that approach on Twitch. I was like, hell do this. You're going to pay me to learn out in the public. Yeah. That's the only thing I need to do is learn out in the public, which is scary. Yeah. But it takes you back to something that's like, Maybe it's scary, but you're setting setting an example and maybe changing a narrative from something that you didn't like before. Like if you can That's be the it. example. Oh, I love that. Right? Yeah. Like, yeah, it sucked for you. So you're going to be brave enough to fucking let it suck in public so then other so, people aren't afraid to have it and suck And truly, no one cares. And we were talking about Conan and Samir and people always see the tip of the ice skirt. We love, this is what I love about this podcast is you're not focusing on just tell me how you got to success. It's like, tell me everything that's happening underneath the ice. Oh, I yeah. want all of that journey. Yeah, I don't want to yeah. know the last 1% that made you get there. Behind every actor, musician, content creator, we all know this. There's a decade of something. Mm-hmm. And in my case, it wasn't a decade of chasing one dream. It was a decade of doing this everywhere yeah. and going, what the fuck am I doing? You wake up days going, what am I like, what am I doing? Why am I all of a sudden starting streaming on Twitch? And my poor dad yeah. is like, I have lost track of what my right. daughter is doing. Yeah. I thought she was going in and settled in politics and gonna do that for the rest of her life. And I don't even know what a Twitch is and I don't even know what a TikTok is. And uh, and but it's fun. Um yeah. and maybe there's a fear to and I think all of this is probably deeply rooted in the fear to be irrelevant one day. Mm. So you try and stay on top of things. And I'm smart enough to know that I'm not going to get the world to adapt to my old view. I'm going to have to move forward with it or I'm left behind. Yeah, it's funny. Like, I think about that too, because, I mean, you see an entire new generation and, like, the trends, the style, the fashion, Mm. the things, like, it's like, oh, shit, like, I'm a generation older now. And I don't necessarily view that as a bad thing. I'm like, oh, this is fun. Like, what's that? And yet I am still paying attention to staying relevant. And that's uh, that. where that motivation comes from is an interesting one. Because do I need the approval of the internet? No, mm-hmm. I don't fucking care. But I think that like more so than like wanting the approval of the cool factor, I come back to culture and community. Mm. And for as long as I give a shit about culture and community, I have to be relevant in order to continue to, to advance that conversation. But so, also you have a desire to be, to, which we spoke about briefly, but which I love about you. You have a desire to be surrounded by people that you deem smarter than you. So you're constantly learning. Oh yeah. And the way you do that. And I think that you are an 
idiot to think that we don't have a shit ton to learn from Gen Z. Mm, yeah. We've just gone through hell. Think mm. about these kids who like had to graduate during a pandemic and mm. there's something there. And this was what was interesting from the YouTube report where they were saying, you know, 61% of, I think it was 61% of Gen Z say that they are a fan or a super fan of something or someone, mm. which really stuck with me because I was like, holy shit, this is redefining fandom completely. If 61% yeah. say they are a super fan of someone or something, and of course, all the all the Twitch streamers, all of the YouTubers, all of the new indie bands that are coming up, all of the tick, like all of these creators have, even if it's just a hundred super fans or a thousand super fans or 10,000 or a hundred fans, we've completely redefined what it means to be relevant and cool for a certain community. Mm -hmm. And I think that Gen Z just doesn't care about numbers. They're like, this is, I actually don't want to be in with the whole crowd loving the same clip. I like this underground subculture yeah. group. That's who I identify with. And they don't fucking care who you are, where you came from. Yeah. They just maybe, love that community. As you're saying that, I'm like, fuck, like maybe like keeping, like I think uh, keeping things real yeah. is popular right yeah. now or it's like it's it's what wins. Yeah. And that's maybe why I still care because as long as people care about making something real, yeah. then like fucking, yeah, I want to be a part of it. Yeah. So I don't know. That's really cool. And I really like your approach on, on just all of it. Like it's cool to sit down and have this conversation that's kind of anywhere and everywhere, but it, it, it that's, that's kind of what it is right now. I think, but that to your point, it's yeah. really hard to define, but I truly think when you take a step back and you look at right back to the initial part of this conversation, how we consume content, how even if you just consume content, the way you consume it today goes from scrolling endlessly on TikTok to maybe flipping to YouTube. I have a friend who never watches YouTube, mm. hasn't spent more than an hour. Like does, YouTube is not a thing she goes to. And I was like, Crazy. wait, YouTube is my second Google. Yeah, I go to Google, I Google for something, and then I go straight into YouTube and Google for the same thing. And I find, and she's like, would never occur to me. I was like, wow, okay wait, what? And I was like, mm -hmm. you and I are just not living in the same world. But there's something there about our relationship to how we are consuming, which, which cracks me up when you look at some of the archaic systems of how like movies are still made and how they're produced and how they're funded. And you go, wait, this makes no sense. When you look at what Gen Z actually wants to watch and wants to consume and where they're watching it and consuming it, they don't want to potentially go into a movie theater at a certain date to watch a movie that you're telling them that is now is the time for them to watch. They're like, no, I want to watch that in six months. So it better be on some kind of streaming platform. Completely. Um, or I want to take as many breaks as I want. There's just something really interesting about, and everything, it's all, it all ties to technology, the evolution, who we are as humans, our attention spans, what we're interested in. And so it's all, if you don't understand, you can't, understand what kind of content you want to create to connect with people if you don't understand the platforms that you're creating it for yeah. and you don't understand the audience that you're creating it for and you mm. don't understand what so to your point you have to surround yourselves and actually listen go back to a point about listening well okay so yeah and going back to another point like that right there because i always try to make this podcast have some amount of utility yeah. right and it's like okay so we're saying this but like how do you then apply yeah. it but i think my takeaway from you the perspective that i've learned is like the way that you can do it the most authentically is like just getting involved and watching it and being a part of mm -hmm. it. Like it actually doesn't need to be much more rocket science than that. If you fuck with F1, watch a bunch of F1 stuff. Mm -hmm. And if you fuck with music, like watch the music stuff you like, wherever you like. And there is a thing today, which I discovered recently, such a thing as a professional fan. No way. If you think about the content that we're consuming about sports, it's not coming from Formula One. It's not coming from ESPN coming from fans just like you who are watching the same races as you or who are either watching them from their sofa or on person or in person i should say and they're creating content potentially as they're doing it because they're like oh my god that was so cool and they have an idea and they share it and they put it out there that's what you're consuming mm. so wow when you think of that dynamic that creators have become fans and fans have become creators then you've completely lost you know it, then yeah. it all gets for all the cards get thrown up in the wet in the air because you start talking about who gets the right to create content. And you see it. You see ESPN taking content from people on Reddit, on Twitter, on Instagram, and posting it. And all they're doing now is curating fan content. <laughs> they will never say that. But that is what they are doing. And they're not alone. Motorsports, autosports. And they'll give a little like hats off or a little bit of a credit to that person of where they took the content from. To your point, the way we're consuming it, but the way I, we're not passive consumers anymore. I think that's what I'm trying to say. Mm. Very few people just sit and consume. 
Mm, mm. You sit and consume and then repeat it to your friends who then go, oh my God, that's a cool idea for a podcast. You consume it, <laughs> talk to your friends and they go, oh my God, I'm doing a documentary about this. Or you yourself are consuming and creating. And that for me is so cool. See that though, like that, that concludes it so well. It's like for you to end, for us to talk about this for an hour and you to say, and that to me is so cool. Instead of be the person shaking a stick at it being like, and I don't know what happens next because <laughs> it's hectic right now or whatever. You're just like, this is fucking sick. Sick. Yeah. Like it's so, how, how can you not be excited by this? Yeah. Overwhelmed? Absolutely. <laughs> Struggling every day? Absolutely. To try to keep up. <laughs> Hell yes. Yeah. Cool? Absolutely as well. Yeah. Like, of course we're struggling. As I said, there's, there's not a week that goes by and I'm like, God, I wish my nine to five job. Right. But you embrace it. Yeah. Damn it. That's cool. Um, that's okay. fun. To fully conclude, yeah. uh, where is the best way Ooh. for somebody to find you uh, to keep up with Sunday fangirls or to find you to find maybe like where they can keep yeah. an eye? Like, I know you have a TikTok and you're streaming yeah. on Twitch. Obviously, you have an Instagram, which is just kind of. I think the Instagram is probably the best place because it's where all my worlds it's like collide. The landing page. Yeah. It's yeah. a bit like my landing page where all of my worlds collide and that's. Tony Cowan Brown, all in one word. Um, cool. And I'll link that. Then. And yeah, and it's the TikTok where I spend most of my time. I, as I say, I generally feel like I live on the internet and that's yeah. F1 Tony, but that's definitely if you love most sports and okay. and you want to be bored to death by all things Formula One, that's the <laughs> place to go. But I like Instagram. I've now rekindled my love with Instagram. I'm just like, I'm going to dump it all. Out yeah. there. I'm not going to pretend that this is just about one thing. It's all basically, as we were saying right at the beginning, people don't hire CVs, they hire human beings. Yeah. So stop pretending you are one person that is good that one thing if you bring to the table a myriad of other things bring it all to bring it all to the table mm, i like um, that i like that a lot i relate to that a whole bunch because it's right? like is he a podcast person is he a car person he is he a all. music person and i'm like ah, it's a lot and of it all we're multifaceted human beings yeah exactly that's who we are and that i think is the biggest shift from by the way that is the biggest shift from remote working is you couldn't hide who you were you were doing it from live from home so if your kid came in screaming you're like yeah by the way i'm a mum of four as well i'm just putting that out there <laughs> or people would see in the background oh wow you read a lot of books like you can't you know you used to be able to just go with a suit or whatever yeah, yeah, your and kind of hide office attire and, and hide camera. hide yeah. everything else and just bring that one thing that you thought we needed Again, that's part of the chaos of today's world, which I love. Fuck, I love that. Well, this has been an absolute it's pleasure. So I'm fun. so glad we got to do this. I'm so honored that you get, came you. on and did an episode. Are you kidding me? I'm super honored. This is fun. I really like this format. Yeah, it was great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.